Listen to the Impact Podcast on all your favorite podcast platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Audible, Spotify, Stitcher, and of course, at impactpodcast.com. This episode of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Closed Loop Partners. Closed Loop Partners is a leading circular economy investor in the United States with an extensive network of Fortune 500 corporate investors, family offices, institutional investors, industry experts, and impact partners. Closed Loop's platform spans the arc of capital from venture capital to private equity, bridging gaps, and fostering synergies to scale the circular economy. To find Closed Loop Partners, please go to www.closedlooppartners.com. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by ERI. ERI has a mission to protect people, the planet, and your privacy, and is the largest fully integrated IT and electronics asset disposition provider and cybersecurity-focused hardware destruction company in the United States, and maybe even the world. For more information on how ERI can help your business properly dispose of outdated electronic hardware devices, please visit eridirect.com. Welcome to another edition of the Impact Podcast. I'm John Shigarian, and I'm so excited to have with us today Stephen Palrand. He's the ecopreneur and founder of Carbon Shack and Home Front Build. Welcome to the Impact Podcast, Stephen. Thank you. It's just an honor to be a guest on your show. I've listened to many episodes. In fact, you know I'm a fan because the algorithm on my phone is constantly bringing up the Impact ad. Oh, so. thank you. Well, but, you know, to be, to be, you know, interviewed along with such luminaries as Graham Hill, you know, I listen to your podcast all the time. Thank you. And those are those, yeah, I'm, I'm lucky. I just get to be the facilitator, but we've had some wonderful guests over the years and, and you're just a, another wonderful guest that we get to have on today. And, you know, Stephen, I want, I really want to go into what you're doing with Carbon Shack and Homefront Bill. But before we do that, talk a little bit about your background. Where'd you grow up? How do you even get interested in the environment? Who are your inspirations? Share a little bit of that, please, with our audience. Yeah, you know, I'm a great uh, outdoorsman. I, my family is from uh, upstate New York, the real upstate, the Adirondacks. Yeah. And if I have to say one thing quickly, I guess that may define me is my name's Steve. Stephen, I was named after my great uncle, Stephen, and my father grew up in a uh, you know uh, industrial town, Glens Falls in Upper New York, which was sort of the... Uh, Lexus, you know, the, the Lexus of the um, uh, lumber industry. So there was uh, paper mills, pulp mills and all that in upstate New York. And uh, our families lived up there for uh, since actually the, you know, uh, 1700s or so. Wow. And um, uh, one of member of the family, Uncle Stephen, moved up into uh, the into the interior of the Adirondack area. And he was a subsistence farmer, basically. He lived completely off the grid. And my father, who lived in, you know, this fancy town, Glens Falls, industry, and, uh, you know, uh, people from New York would come up, you know, during the Prohibition and everything and, and drink in and, and, uh, Lake George and all that. So he was in this, you know, very fancy urbanite town, and he loved to go to his uncle's place because his uncle had an outhouse. They canned, they made all their, you know, all their vegetables and canned everything. The pond had trout in it. I mean, it was just this, this circular economy and subsistence living. Now, of course, it was hard living. But uh, but he just was in love with that ability to be in touch and a part of the natural world. So I think if that's like that's you know one thing, it's it's that legacy that you know my father uh, brought to me. Um, um, but uh, yeah. but on the uh, you know the other uh, part of you know who I am and all that, I I um, I did uh, when I was in high school and college, I worked with an architect and uh, a contractor. I did both. So I was really into design build, which is our business model from a very early point. Um, I did study uh, architectural history in college, and that led me to, uh, you know, when I moved to Los Angeles, it led me to uh, just enjoy uh, the wonderful, um, you know, architectural history museum that we have in Los Angeles. So um, I moved out uh, to California, and um, because of my architecture and uh, construction background, I worked in the film business, building, designing and building sets. Wow. And uh, so 
that's you know how I started here. What happened is I bought a house and an old craftsman house, and it was. Um, I took my I remember taking my mother to it, and she burst into tears. She was like, "Oh, how could my son?" You know, how could he, you know, how could it be so horrible in his life that he'd bought in this boarded up old house? I was like, no, mom, it's really a a diamond in the rough. And I restored it and it really was a diamond in the rough. Well, uh, you know, architecture is is near and dear to my heart here in L.A. I got to I got to be baptized when I was much younger, when I was a real estate developer with Brenda Levin. And I also Mm. got to become friends with Julia Shulman, the very famous architectural photographer. Yeah, boy, they those are those are really wonderful people to to see the world through their eyes and to understand their vision of architecture and restoration and everything else. It was a real great experience when I was a much younger guy. So, yeah. you know, we we undervalue uh, Los Angeles in many ways, but our, our Los Angeles driving around Los Angeles is is almost is like driving around a, a museum of domestic American architecture. You see everything here from Victorian. Uh, to craftsman, to storybook, to, uh, and of course, we're known for evolving the California bungalow style as well as the mid century with Neutra and Schindler. So when you're driving around Los Angeles, you really are seeing this, this amazing diversity of um, history of domestic American architecture. So I just love driving around here and just the architectural, uh, you know, the uh, architectural community we have here historically is just wonderful. So what was the impetus and when did you start Carbon Shack? And for our listeners and viewers to find what you're doing at Carbon Shack and Homefront Build, they could go to carbonshack.com or homefrontbuild.com. What was the impetus and when did you uh, found these uh, companies and what's the mission behind them? Yeah, well, you know, it all really began with that uh, purchase of the Craftsman Home. I was working in the film business and doing sets and everything. And... Um, the film business goes through these cyclical uh, chaoses with, uh, you know, uh, writer strikes and stuff like that. And it really was after 9-11 that, um, and what happens is that the business just constricts. And I was doing mostly work on commercials. And when the business constricts and goes through those kinds of constrictions, all those little production companies go out of business and you have to make all new contacts and stuff like that. And I just was getting so sick of it. I purchased this cra- craftsman house and was restoring it. And, uh, you know, because of my background in architectural history, I just really wanted to take that house apart and restore it and find out what the original stencil, yeah, I found the original stencils. I actually, in that house, I restored the gas lighting because it came from this really interesting period of, arch- uh, of architectural history in Los Angeles when we were introducing electrification to homes and we were transitioning away from gas and gas lighting. So there's this fascinating period in, in the early uh, 1900s of about 10 years when um, homes were plumbed for gas and a light, electric lighting. So the gas, it would be in one fixture. The gas would be up and the electric light bulb would be hanging down. And uh, this home had all its gas still plumbed for the lighting. So I had this friend who, uh, who uh, has historic light fixtures and we actually restored all the gas lighting. There was amazing. The plumbing inspectors were just, they loved coming to the house because you can't plumb a house for gas lighting anymore. But if you have it, the code allows you to keep it. So I restored the gas lighting. I restored the stencils. I just did this wonderful job. And it was just this creative, you know, uh, delving into the architectural history of the city, of this period of of design and uh, the house itself. And so, of course, you know, people in the neighborhood stopped by, hey, what are you doing? They saw what I was doing. Can you do that to my house? And that just, that's how I grew the business. Um, I got out of, uh, it's just so enjoyable to work with homeowners and deal with three-dimensional space versus dealing with two-dimensional space and uh, producers and directors. A lot of nice producers and directors out there. So if anybody's listening, don't get me wrong. But, you know, the Hollywood business was just uh, not something that I, you know, I, I, it was it was a joy to transition away from that. Let's right. say that. So so that began Homefront Build. And Homefront Build is, um, it's really, it's a company that uh, deals with uh, remodels, additions, or new construction that are uh, about uh, the historic vernacular styles in Los Angeles. Like I said, you know, we have such a wide range of historic vernacular styles in Los Angeles, Spanish colonial, craftsman, mission. So it's people who have a historic 
uh, or a period house, and they want to <clears throat> remodel or add to it. Uh, I mean, a common uh, project for us in that company is to uh, take a smaller home, single story Spanish, and create a, a two story house out of it. So, uh, you know, in, in doing that, uh, building that business, what we would do is that when USC or something was uh, taking a house down, demolishing a house to make way for multifamily or student housing, we would go in and deconstruct that house in order to have pieces for our uh, our old home projects because we wanted to have two by fours that were really two by four. We wanted to have an old redwood siding that was milled uh, back when the um, the mills were, you know, moved, uh, the machines moved slower. So there were mill marks on the siding or we wanted to have flooring. All those elements of a house, if we were adding to a craftsman or something, we wanted to have those components so that the uh, addition would not only look synonymous and be compatible, but also the building materials and all those details would be compatible. So, uh, but one day, you know, we're, uh, I, you know, I was walking around my yard and I was like, wow, we got three craftsmen homes stacked over there, two Victorians, you know, and a Spanish and a mission. And it's like, we're the greenest people around because we're taking people, we're, we're, we're encouraging people to adaptive reuse, to reuse existing structures and, and insulate them. Our home front build business is really just have people adapt these homes, insulate them. And, uh, you know, they're really the greenest people around, but when we're adding to them or doing additions, new construction, we're, uh, we're doing it with material from within the inner city. So that began us thinking about embodied carbon footprint. Okay, operational carbon footprint is sort of the low hanging fruit conceptually because there's been so much work in it. So taking an old structure or a new structure, insulating it, putting solar on the roof, you know, we know how to reduce our operational carbon footprint, the day to day carbon cost of living in a house. But where there's been less work, is in the embodied carbon footprint, the one-time cost of building something or making something. So having all these stacks of material and doing this naturally began us thinking about uh, how to address embodied carbon footprint in new construction. So that burst the carbon shack journey, which is really about pulling embodied carbon into the conversation and not just operational uh, carbon. So, um, so what we did is that we, we, we built this new house and we call it Casa Zero or, you know, zero carbon footprint. And, uh, a developer came along to me because people knew that I was always trying to, uh, deconstruct old homes. And they said, Hey, I got this craftsman. We're, we're taking it down. Uh, you know, do you want it? And I said, yes. So we, we, in this case, what we did is we, we videoed, we did time-lapse photography, and you can go to our website and we have uh, a series of uh, videos on this. And what we did is we videotaped the deconstruction of this house, and we also tracked the cost of it to prove that taking a house apart, a structure apart, uh, was actually not more expensive and it was in fact cheaper once you considered that you got all this new material out of it uh, than if you demoed it and bought new materials. So like a phoenix rising again from the ashes, what we did is we documented the taking a part of this house. And then we, instead of milling new material and transporting it to market, we just transported it within five miles to this new site and built a brand new house out of it. And that's that's the carbon check uh, that's journey. Really, it's, it's really the shift from that we're seeing all across all different type of sectors from a linear to circular economy, you took a, a home and put that into the circular economy of uh, transport as well. What's fascinating. Exactly. So because it's the reuse, recycle thing, yeah. right? Reuse first. Yeah. Really? So so what we proved and is that you can, you know, we can take a house apart, build a new house because we're always going to have new construction. We're always going to have development. Sure. And my kids could take this, my house, this house apart that I built and build another house. Because the material is the material, when you're looking at construction in Los Angeles, what you're looking at with these older homes is you're looking at old growth Douglas fir. That old growth Douglas fir, you can't get anymore. 
you know, the cladding is old growth redwood. So this is this is material that is highly valuable. And when you take when you when what all developers do is they just lot clear, send it off to the dump. But when that wood decomposes in the dump, as you know from your other guests, is that that just causes all sorts of methane and all sorts of pollution. Right. But if you reuse it, you know, think of the think of how much you've lowered your carbon footprint. So, uh, so that that reuse cycle to lower the embodied carbon footprint uh, was uh, what we were looking at. The other thing that came out of this carbon check project, which I think is critical, is that. Um, all the work we were doing, the the house is completely framed in in wood that we salvaged from a house that was framed in 1910. Uh, you know, except for the new in California, we have you know seismic issues. So some of the new beams for oh. uh, we had to use new LVLs and stuff like that. But we kept it, you know, we kept it to a minimum. But 80 percent of the house is framed with reused uh, lumber. We put an immense of solar array PV on the on the roof. We, I put in, you know, solar hot water. I put in a heat pump, hot water heater, a heat, you know, it's an all electric house, induction cooked up, everything, 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 you know, heat, heat pump for heating and cooling. But the story, and that's what's almost the hard thing with this, the story is trapped behind the walls. The heat pump is in the, is in the basement, the crawl space. The heat pump, hot water heater is outside. The story of sustainability is, is not seen. And it's not a part of your daily life. So um, my wife, uh, Rachel Mary, um, she's an artist who works at the intersection of art and science. Um, she's well known for being a, uh, uh, she makes some um, content for non-human primates. Think about that. She's great at a, she's great at a, uh, a cocktail party when she, <laughs> but she works at the intersection of art and science. And uh so what she always wanted to do is she always wanted to uh, uncover the natural world that we cohabit in our houses, because, you know, there is all sorts of, when you think about it, um, you know, our, uh, we think about nature, we think about the natural world, we think about the wild as being in a national park far away from us somewhere, you know, somewhere else. Sure. But the natural world is really within our communities, within our houses, and of course, within our bodies. When you think about it, there's 50% of the DNA in our bodies is, um, is alien DNA, bacteria primarily, that we co-evolved with. When you think about our houses, we think about the negative things of mold and all that, but you can't get rid of it. There is There are spiders, there is, there is mold, there's all this natural element within our house. Um, so what she wanted to do was uncover those that, that history, that that coexistence of the natural environment in our houses in order to tell the story of our of our coexistence with the environment how every choice we make in our house every choice we make in our life has impact on our natural environment the wild inside of us as well as the wild outside of us so what we did was we we started to we designed and made all our own uh products our furniture we we made tile designs uh and we fired them with a local tile manufacturer. We made our own light fixtures. We really wanted to bring the story of sustainability from behind the walls into the finishes, mm -hmm. uh, into the plaster, into the into the furniture, so that you're coexisting with that story and not just, you know, someone designed it for it and you know then it's behind the behind what, the base. What year did you start Carbon Shack? Um, oh, that's boy! I should have that one on the on the tip of my tongue, but um, approximately, uh, uh, it's twenty twenty three. So you know, twenty fifteen or twenty sixteen, okay. maybe uh, seven or eight years ago. Yeah, that was the you know. It's always fascinating to understand the intersection of sustainability and commercial commercial uh, success. What's the response been since you started this venture? And 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 the and the and the uptick of people wanting to live in a more sustainable way, both from their home perspective and otherwise, because historically sustainability had the negative connotation when it came to home living as maybe more expensive, maybe less comfortable, and the creature comforts that we've all become very uh, uh, accustomed to uh, disavow us of those. Uh, Stephen, and also explain the commercial success of Carbon Shack. Well, you know, uh, 
sustainability has a bad rap and uh, it's about, you know, and I think deservedly so in some ways. It's about, uh, you know, people think of living sustainably, living green as, you know, only being able to travel as far as you can walk in a day, uh, living in a yurt and having an outhouse, you know. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, we, we, we got that bad rap for good reasons. When I first moved to California 25 years ago or something, taking a shower with those first early shower heads was like taking a shower and being cut by lasers. It was painful. Right. Um, you know, but shower heads now, the industry has evolved such that you have rain heads in our, uh, you know, low water use uh, California. And they're wonderful. Right. You know, we have low flush toilets, you know, people make fun of the low flush toilets and they deserve to make fun of them. But now with cyclonic action and one gallon, 1.1 gallon flushing, they're amazing. You know, I, I still have a Volt that with the V, e, you know, EV, and that was a transition vehicle. And, you know, that was kind of like suffering because, you know, you turn on your heater and, uh, you know, use up, you know, you use up the battery, but now EVs, you know, are amazing. So, you know, I think because, but, but the industry has evolved so rapidly. So it's constantly reminding people that, um, going green does not mean, uh, you know, losing comfort or spending more money and you can of course spend money. I think the best example of how the industry has changed is of course, Tesla and Elon Musk. I mean, you know, his, when you think about his, uh, his, you know, fleet, you know, you have the S, the three, the X and the Y, right? And that right. spells sexy, right? You know, you turn the three backwards, you know, and that's, you know, I don't know why he couldn't do E instead of, and he had to use three. I'm right. sure there's a story there that, right. but, you know, and what he proved is that he proved driving an EV was not like driving a Prius. It's high performance. It's cutting edge technology. It's comfortable. It's fashionable. It's cool. Oh, and it's also green. So, you know, think of how far the industry has come. Think about something more particular to my business, which is induction cooktops. You know, when I grew up with electric cooktops, if you have an all electric house, you have to have electric, you can't have gas. Electric cooktops were miserable. They take forever to heat the heating element to heat up and they're just, you know, horrible to control. Induction cooktops are amazing. Induction cooktops are amazing, not because, you know, you can have an all electric house, but they're amazing to cook with they boil water instantly. You know, it's just the, the cleanup is, it's a piece of glass. So the cleanup is amazing. And it's also good for the environment because it's, you know, you can have an all electric house. So when you think about how far the technology has come in 10 years, even in five years, uh, you know, you just, you know, you just, it's no longer about losing comfort. It's about living green is about being on the cutting edge of design. It's about being on the cutting edge of technology. And, uh, you know, it's also, uh, you know, affordable. What are the, the certifications? I know, and I've had many interviews with great leaders who are s chief sustainability officers of very large corporations, and they're managing lots of real estate. So we talk a lot about LEED Platinum Certified. In the, in the, in the home building business, what are the certifications when, when it comes to um, LEED or well, or fit well, or does that matter anymore? And 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 where does Carbon Shack fall within that that uh, certification process? Yeah, I mean, there's all sorts of uh, certifications, lead and passive house. And as far as residential construction goes, they really, I mean, I love all those organizations for setting standards and setting goals. But they're they're um, the problem with those is that they're orthodox. You either do it my way or the highway, mm. and that just is ineffective uh, for residential because you're turning too many people away. Orthodoxy in politics, culture, sustainability, it just doesn't, it just doesn't work. So what we try to do is, is, you know, and passive house and there's other standards where you, uh, and again, those are wonderful. Those, those, those uh, groups have provided so much uh, help and education. But when you look at those, and there's even one I won't mention, you know, that you then have to recertify every year. Well, lead, you know, I did lead. We're we're lead platinum on my Casa Zero, the Casa Zero project, the first we did. But it cost twenty or thirty thousand for the consultant. Who's going to do that when they can have another bathroom for that? So wow. they're just not accessible for the residential, um, you know, community, the residential construction community, and they're too orthodox. So what we do is that we're trying to meet people where they are. 
if your goal, if you can be 5% more sustainable or 90% more sustainable, that's fine. I have a client who, you know, we got their house. It's an old, this is more of a home from build project where it's an old Spanish colonial revival, but we insulated it. We made it, we made it, uh, you know, we put solar panels on the roof, heat pumps to, you know, heat the air, heat pump, hot water heater, everything. But the client insisted that they have a gas range. Well, okay. Okay, that might not have gotten the certification of, you know, some of these organizations, but I got them 95% of the way. That's great. I think that, you know, for Orthodox, we're going to turn off too many people yeah. and we have to meet people where they are because you know, we have too much work to do. So if you can get people part of the way, uh, that's valid. Perfect. Because I can't, 5% of the people being 100% perfect, that's just not going to work. And perfect is such a false goal anyway. It really is. It's It's foolishness. Yeah. And like you said, now they're happy. They got the stove that they want and and you and you built them a beautiful home that's uh, 95% there. Yeah. And the other thing is that in residential, you know, often people look to, I spent, uh, had to spend a bunch of time in uh, in a year uh, this fall because my wife was on sabbatical. But um, you you look there and, and you realize that people are sort of have different risk assessment uh, in Europe where they're more trusting in government. And that's wonderful. Yeah. But the the problem is that they're also trusting government to solve the problem. In the United States, we trust government a little bit less. We throw things back on individual decisions. But individual decisions in the face of climate change can seem too monumental. If I get an EV, is it really going to matter? What we do is we tell people that, yes, every individual decision you make, no matter you know how small, does matter. If you're getting new, uh, if you're getting just a new range, that decision to choose a gas range commits you to using fossil fuel for three, four more decades. Um, if you're just getting a, a you know washer dryer, that choice really does matter. And those individual choices, I would argue, lead to greater political change because when you inform people, and there's a lot of people out there who can't, you know, say afford a new house, whatever. They're making small micro choices. Those micro choices bring awareness and lead to political change. So we try to meet people at the individual decision, the micro decision, and you know where they are. Um, we did set up. I don't know if I uh, mentioned this uh, previously before the show, but we have set up this website called sustainablebuild.org. And in that uh, website, what it's a it's a basically open source website with these wonderful advanced calculators uh, that you can go and you can plug in your zip code, and it can show you how, compared to the average house in your neighborhood, if you make a choice to uh, use you know dry your laundry on a line versus a dryer versus do larger decisions, what the impact of those decisions will make, so that you can. Uh, you can make the best decision for your budget. That's so sustainable, sustainable build. Build. org. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. And we did it as a separate site because, you know, if it was a dot com site, people would think that it was linked to right. making money. But what we're doing is we're taking the knowledge that we've learned and we're putting it on an open source site. So given that we're in the now in the first quarter of twenty twenty three and the Inflation Reduction Act has uh, has really uh helping many industries right now. Is it going to affect what you do, the residential construction uh, industry, especially when it comes to sustainability and what you're doing um, at Carbon Shack? Uh, yes and no. Uh, there's some aspects of it, uh, which of course are wonderful, mostly related to the PV and, and solar you know, storage. So, um, you know, of course, they restored the 30% tax credit for panels, and then uh, now you get 30% for solar storage. Uh, so that's great because, of course, that will add a kick to the industry and, you know, more production will lower costs, et cetera, et cetera. So stimulating that part of the market is really great and very impactful. Um, also, there's now a $2,000 credit for heat pumps, which, of course, is great. Other stuff like $600 for windows, which used to be lifetime and now it's annual. Who buys one window a year? Nobody buys one window a year. So some of these things are just scratching your head is like, what does that have, you know, how is that going to impact anything? So the, you know, the IRA, of course, is is uh, wonderful. And the Inflation Reduction Act is really wonderful. But the problem with it from a policy point of view and the problem with it for uh, our clients is that um, the, the policy is instituted through credits and rebates. Rebates tend to be small. You get them back from your utility, but credits... You know, for the low income, uh, lower incomes, if you're not paying enough income tax, 
you're not, tax credit does you nothing. So the irony of this policy is that it really almost makes it, you know, it's impossible to, for people in lower incomes to use this tax credit because they're just not, uh, they're just not paying enough taxes to get a credit. So it's a, uh, you know, it's, it, it is of course an important, um, piece of legislation, but, uh, you know, it's not, it, it has its problems. So we're trying to evolve ways to uh, address some of those things through different leasing scenarios for solar. You know, Stephen, when I've read about you, I've, I've read it, I read your line about making the visible, invisible, visible. Can you explain making the invisible visible when it comes to what you do at Carbon Shack and, uh, and, and with regards to sustainable home building? Yeah, well, that uh, goes back to the you know, my wife and this, uh, you know, thing where we wanted to, uh, make the, uh, you know, the, the invisible process, the, the things that were behind the wall visible, right. but also some of that is also talking about, uh, the beauty and the fragility of nature. Uh, you know, we're sort of reacting against the mid-century concept of the machine made and the mass produced for us when we're producing homes. It's not only important to have the, you know, the touch of nature, but also the touch of hu the human. So our plaster is hand applied. Our furniture is made by local craftsmen because, you know, why do we love farmer's markets? We love farmer's markets because we want to get to know our producer. Living in a house that you know and feel that someone made and crafted for you uh, is really a wonderful experience. So that it, you know, it puts you in touch with you know, uh, nature and puts you in touch with the craftsmen. And, and so that's, you know, I think the, you know, what we're trying to get to with making the vis invisible visible. And speaking of that, you also have a showroom in Los Angeles, um, um, under the, under the heading of things we make and sell, explain the showroom, where does it exist and what can people expect to find there? And on your website, things we make and sell. Yeah. As I mentioned, uh, you know, we started to produce our own designs and our own lighting, furniture, uh, tile, and fabric. And so it was just a natural extension for us to open a showroom. So when you come to the showroom, uh, you know, you can touch and feel uh, our stuff and see some of our, some of our stuff. And where is it? Where is the showroom actually? Oh, it's in, uh, it's, it's in our, uh, it's part of our office. It's in uh, Cypress Park in near Dodger Stadium. Oh, Those beautiful. Come to Dodger Stadium. It's in so, that part of town, South Pasadena, Pasadena. Got it. And then what's and what's and you know, what's the future? I mean, this sounds like this sounds like the big idea. I mean, this sounds like where people really want to be living more sustainability. There's a whole new generation of 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 people that no longer want to be degrading the earth. They want to be doing the right thing of, with regards to their home and their their living circumstances. So, what's your what's your vision for Carbon Shack and home front build in the future? Well, you know, it's just about information. I mean, you know, right now, if you go to buy a car, it's easy to make that choice. What it, it Carbon Shack, what we're doing about is, you know, we're, we're providing people with information because it's hard to find information yes. on how to live sustainability in, in residential construction. Yes. You know, in commercial and government, it's it's well regulated, but in residential, you know, the government's hands off. So people want to live sustainably, but they don't know how. So that's where we came up even with Sustainable Build is is to help guide people through this process so that they're the way they live matches their values is is um is are your is most of your work with carbon shack in the greater los angeles area or do you do it do you actually work in other states as well with some of your clients in uh, other oh yeah yeah we we design obviously nationally and we just tend to build locally because our construction team is local of course but designing and selling our products, that's national. You know, selling the product could be international, but uh, wow. designing, we design uh, outside of Los Angeles. <clears throat> but we keep our uh, construction to the Los Angeles County area. Yeah. That's wonderful. And for any of our listeners and, and viewers who want to find Stephen and the great work he's doing at Carbon Shack, you go to www.carbonshack.com or, of course, Home Front Bill, www.homefrontbill.com. Stephen, it's been an absolute delight to have you on today. What you're doing is fascinating. It's really important stuff. I appreciate you making the world a better and greener and more sustainable place. And you're always welcome back on the Impact Podcast to keep sharing the journey that you're on. Well, thank you so much. And I've really enjoyed your podcast. I listen to, uh, you know, I, I now know more about sustainable rendering of uh, animals than, and, and it's just wonderful to hear all, be informed about all the different aspects of the sustainable community. So thank you for your podcast. 
continued success. Yes. This episode of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by CO2.com. Companies today are trying to figure out how to achieve high quality climate credentials. CO2.com is the easy button for any business to go beyond offsetting and fund truly impactful projects across carbon, nature, and community. CO2 provides verified metrics that can be used in reporting and messaging. Have confidence in demonstrating your climate leadership. Go to CO2.com to access quality climate credentials you can trust on the road to net zero and nature positive. This edition of the Impact Podcast is brought to you by Engage. Engage is a digital booking platform revolutionizing the talent booking industry. With thousands of athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and business leaders, Engage is the go-to spot for booking talent, for speeches, custom experiences, live streams, and much more. For more information on Engage or to book talent today, visit letsengage.com.